colorless, odorless, priceless. Our most precious natural resource is becoming more precious than ever. Our relationship to water is about to change everywhere in the world, whether you live in a developed country or a developing country. We've been predicting global water shortages for 30 years. Suddenly they're appearing. The cotton textile industry has responded by finding ways to use far less water in factories. We've proved that it's possible to save a great deal of water in the denim manufacturing. And in the field. The way we farm now versus the way we farmed eight, ten years ago is dramatically changed. The global water crisis is inspiring innovation and creativity and an unquenchable desire to find solutions. It is a momentous day at Central Textiles in China. Delivery of a state-of-the-art recycling system that will save millions of gallons of water. Halfway around the globe, some of the world's biggest companies meet to find ways to reduce water consumption in every link of the cotton chain. And back in Hong Kong, a fashion consortium also includes some of the industry's major players and has the same goal. Around the world, in factories and in laboratories, there is an ongoing search for ways to create cotton garments with less water. It's an industry-wide response to a potential crisis. Author Charles Fishman traveled the world for his book on water. I think in the developed world, we've had a hundred years of what I think of as the golden age of water. Water that is unlimited, safe, and free the golden age of water is over. There are stark illustrations of the problem. But among the dried up riverbeds that dot the landscape, there is also reason for optimism. When you travel around the world, what you see is not just that people are tackling their own water problems, you see an incredible blossoming of water technology and water innovation. When it comes to cotton apparel, that innovation is found throughout each of the three primary links of the cotton chain. Textile processing, caring for the finished garment, and growing the cotton in the first place. Agriculture is where some of the greatest improvements are being made. We're running out of water and we're going to have to produce cotton in such a way that it makes much more efficient use of the water. Cotton is sometimes criticized as being a thirsty crop, but in fact it is remarkably drought tolerant. What would the ideal plant look like if we started with a blank sheet of paper and said what would we put on a plant to make it a really water useful plant? Uh, what you find is you incorporate almost all the characteristics of a cotton plant into that plant. If you've got lots of water, it will take every bit you give it and grow and grow and grow and produce more and more and more yield. But the other side of cotton, unlike a lot of crops, is if you don't have that water available, you can throttle it back a whole lot and use that water very efficiently. This is where cotton is king, the high plains of North Texas, where much of the U.S. crop is grown. The plants could grow on rainfall alone, but irrigation makes them far more productive. Not the irrigation of the past, sprinklers that wasted water due to evaporation, or flooding entire rows. New techniques use far less water. In this case, it is delivered directly to the soil. The water is being applied right at the ground level where runoff evaporation from the soil surface or into the air is essentially zero. People do everything they can to use water in the most efficient way. They have to to stay in business. It's not just a matter of what they want to do, it's what they have to do to survive economically. Two-thirds of the U.S. cotton crop is actually grown with rainfall alone. But when supplemental water is needed, the buzzword today is precision irrigation. And nothing is more precise than subsurface drip. 
which features a pipe running underground. This system is a means to deliver our very limited amount of water that we've got available, supplemental water, uh, directly to a plant, a plant's root system, where it can take it up and use it. There's not another system like that. Far beneath these Texas cotton fields is the source of this water, the Ogallala Aquifer. 170,000 square miles of underground water stretching from South Dakota to North Texas. Every year, five trillion gallons are pumped out of the aquifer to irrigate all kinds of crops, and it is slowly being depleted. Local growers, whose families have often worked this same land for generations, are worried about the future. When my grandfather farmed, it wasn't that much of an issue because it was plentiful. Uh, you, you farmed what you wanted to because you, you knew you had the water available. Um, my generation, it's, it's going to determine everything that we uh, make plans for production on uh, for my lifetime. What we're trying to do is not pump next year's water this year, you might say. And we believe that we can manage our aquifer and we're not as hard on it if we moderate our pumping. To reduce water consumption, cotton producer Glenn Schur uses a system called Smart Crop, allowing him to monitor the moisture in his fields via his computer or phone. We've shut the water off as much as a week to 10 days early, and that saves about an inch and a half to two inches of water a year on our, on our crop and still maintain the same or, or a better yield. Part of the motivation for water conservation is economic. Pumping comes with a price tag. The economic pressure is there to try to push the water consumption down. Uh, it's getting too costly uh, with the price of energy um, going up. Um, it's getting too costly to pump it out of the ground. Now we've got to figure out a way to pump less out of the ground to grow the same crop. That is also the goal of scientists who are trying to make cotton and other crops resistant to drought often by locating the specific genes that can make a vast difference. Each of these spots represents an individual cotton gene, and we're interested in identifying specific genes that are responsive to drought and heat stress. Work at the genetic level is being conducted in government labs and at research universities. The goal is to produce varieties that are far less thirsty, most of the industry, most of academia realizes um, this critical need and we're really just now gearing up uh, in this area of research in cotton. So I think in the short term we'll make some significant improvements. My personal goal is to use half as much as we currently use, half as much water, so that would have a major impact. Now to actually reach that goal through time may take 10 to 20 years but you have to have a high goal if you want to have a large impact towards, towards cotton. All these advances in the field, in factories, and in labs can be transferred to cotton growers and textile manufacturers around the world. This research that I am doing will have a global impact because the results and the findings that we come up with can be transferred to other breeding populations, be it in China or India. Companies in China and India and other nations now dominate the next stage of the cotton chain, textile manufacturing. Back at Central Textiles, the new high-tech system uses a vibrating membrane that removes indigo molecules after dyeing. So the same water can be used again and again. Textile dyeing and finishing uses a great deal of water. And we were trying to find a way of kind of minimizing the water use and also improve uh, the waste stream that comes out. Using this system, we're able to recycle 80% upwards of the water that is being used in the dyeing process. That translates to about 20,000 gallons of water saved every day, seven million gallons over the course of a year. This recycling system is funded in part by Cotton Incorporated, the organization that promotes cotton and searches for ways to keep cotton environmentally friendly. This is the leading edge of what's taking place, not only in Asia, 
but around the world. And here at Central Textiles Facility, we have the opportunity to get involved with a leading company that's looking for sustainable solutions that will benefit manufacturing as well as the potential to have a dramatic reduction in water usage and chemical usage in indigo dyeing, which is such an important part of cotton textile manufacturing. Central Textiles is hardly alone. This manufacturer in Bangladesh collects rainwater during the monsoon season, then uses it in production. Again, millions of gallons of water are saved. It just makes good business sense uh, because you are becoming more sustainable. At the same time, uh, a lot of these practices help reduce your costs. Uh, so that is why uh, I think a lot of, of that has already happened and taken place uh, in Asia and in China. And not just in Asia. In Mexico, this gigantic plant makes jeans for Levi's. Seven million pairs every year. This is where your jeans are brushed by hand, where they are given that cherished, distressed look. The water-saving innovations here are endless using golf balls instead of a liquid solution to soften jeans, and bleaching with ozone rather than water. With the use of the ozone technology, what happens is that you don't, use, you don't have to use water and you do not have to use chemicals. So there's also a, a chemical savings and also a water savings. Today we're talking about water reductions in the neighborhood of 80 to 90 percent compared to what we used to do before. The final link in the cotton chain is consumer aftercare, washing an article of clothing throughout its lifetime. This GE factory in Kentucky makes a new generation of washing machines, designed with conservation in mind. If you look at a washing machine 10 years ago, probably used about 50 gallons of water in a traditional agitator top load washer. Today's washers are going to use about half of that, only 24 to 25 gallons of water to do a full size load. You can use as little as 15 gallons of water. It's over 75% savings over a washing machine just 10 years ago. In addition to washing machines that use less water, expect to see clothing that requires less washing. There's new projects that which we're working on as, as we speak on ways to reduce the number of times that you have to wash a garment at home. So th that's, that's coming up very soon. There are major efforts underway in every link of the cotton chain. Textile manufacturers who turn cotton into clothing. Industries that keep that clothing clean. And of course, the family farmers who have grown the cotton for generations. In the last 30 years, U.S. farmers have reduced the amount of water they use 15%, while increasing the amount of crop they grow 70%. So they have doubled their water productivity in the last 30 years. The water in our area is the uh, lifeblood of the whole area, really. It's a finite resource, and uh, I hope someday that uh, you know future gen generations can use it just like I I've experienced it. This generation has to do its utmost to uh, preserve uh, the resources that we have on this planet. And I'm doing this for the next generation, and I'm just asking the whole of the textile industry to join me. What makes me optimistic is, despite climate change, despite population growth, people in local communities are saying, we're not going to wait for somebody else to solve our water problems, we're going to solve them ourselves. People solving problems in every corner of the globe, ensuring that this ancient crop will always be there and will always be getting better. The good news is that we've just really begun to scratch the surface of what this plant can do. There is a whole lot of room for improvement. This entire industry is infused with a determination to satisfy the world's hunger for cotton, while remembering that the world is also thirsty for water that is clean, fresh, and always available.